What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Bush coming at you solo today to reevaluate the 2019, 2020, and 2021 running back classes. So basically what we're going to be doing in this video, if you guys haven't seen the wide receiver version of this video, go check that out. What I'm going to be doing is reviewing the previous draft classes running backs using the metrics that I talked about in this video. Running backs to target and avoid. I talked about the 2022 running back class, players that you should be targeting and avoiding in rookie drafts about a month ago. So go check that out for a more in-depth look on the metrics that I covered. But because I did this for wide receivers already, I wanted to see if it was accurate for running backs as well. Make sure the scores were relatively accurate so we could predict either the busts and the sleepers from these draft classes. Knowing what we know now, maybe we can better identify some of the busts and sleepers from those draft classes. So we're starting to get into redraft season. So we're going to be shifting focus away from rookies and dynasty and stuff like that. Aside from, you know, weekly dynasty decisions in the next couple of weeks, our redraft rankings manifesto will be dropping next week, along with our early top 12 positional rankings on YouTube for you guys to check out. Um, so if that interests you, if you want access to our redraft rankings, check out the Patreon, check out Underdog Fantasy. You can get access to our redraft rankings manifesto, dynasty rankings manifesto, either of those two ways. Like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed this video as well. Now let's hit the intro. Okay, so if you haven't seen the running backs to target and avoid video yet, I would encourage you to go watch it first. But just a quick review, if you just want to see this video of the metrics that we covered in the previous video on the screen right now, you should see two graphics, one on the left and one on the right. These are the nine metrics that we looked for and the percentage of running backs that cleared these thresholds. So the criteria that we were looking for was RB1s, right? We wanted to know what all the RB1s from 2015 to 2021 had in common. Were they all, you know, above a certain weight? Were they a certain speed level? Were they very productive in college, et cetera, et cetera? The left graphic is for running backs who had one RB1 season from 2015 to 2021. The right graphic is for guys who did it multiple times. So these were the true dynasty assets, Jonathan Taylor, Derrick Henry, Saquon Barkley type of running backs. There's a distinct difference between the running back position and the wide receiver position, as you guys might notice with these metrics. As we talked about in the previous video with wide receivers, production was king. The running backs' uh, highest scoring areas were not production related, which is something that we need to shift focus in terms of scouting in because size thresholds of 205 plus pounds above a 29 BMI, having a math bomb relative athletic score, which is basically a combination of their size and their athleticism above the 50th percentile and a weight adjusted speed score above the 50th percentile were the most predictive metrics. And Basically, what this means is that we want freak athletes at running back size, speed, all of that matters. But for wide receivers, that it doesn't really translate. We want guys that are productive at wide receivers, but uh, at wide receiver, but at running back, it's not necessarily as important to be very, very productive in college. So following that, the next most predictive metric was production related things like dominator, because typically workhorse backs in college are workhorse backs in the NFL, or at least better suited to be workhorse backs in the NFL and guys who are in committees in college and can't, you know, command a full workload likely don't suddenly get to the NFL and start commanding a full workload when the guys that are hitting you are bigger, faster, stronger. If you can't handle those hits in college, you usually can't handle them in the NFL as well. Then we had draft capital. Obviously, opportunity is very crucial to the running back position. So if you're a sixth round pick, you probably need an injury or you need to just be a lot better than your competition to actually earn touches in your backfield. Then the least important stuff was a target share above 7%. So we want guys that can catch passes, but it wasn't necessarily a requirement. We've seen Derrick Henry, Nick Chubb, guys like that finishes RB1s without pass catching upside. I would say top five upside is probably more necessarily geared towards pass catching backs. But uh, just being an RB1 in general didn't necessarily require it. Age-related metrics also not overly important. Uh, things like being an early declare, being 21.9 years or younger, uh, years old or younger, sorry, on draft day were also uh, not very predictive. So using these nine metrics that we talked about and keeping in mind how important and predictive each one was, we're going to go back and reevaluate the 2021, 2020, and 2019 draft classes and see if we're able to predict who smashed and who busted based on how they were as prospects. Because if we can do that, then obviously this system is very accurate and we can use it for draft classes going forward. And again, we're going to get off of rookie stuff probably until next year, right after this video. But let's start with last year's draft class with the huge caveat that it's, it's only been one year. We don't know for sure if these guys are hits or misses. There's no guarantee. But based on the information that we have, we can try and make a distinction. The two highest scores in this class, unsurprisingly, were Travis Etienne and Najee Harris, who were both first round running back expected to be the top two guys 
from this draft class. And the third guy, again, unsurprisingly, was Javante Williams. Pretty much everybody who val- evaluated running backs last year, aside from a couple people that just wanted to get cute, had one of those three running backs as RB1 in the class. Travis Etienne was my RB1 in the class last year. A lot of people had Najee Harris in the fantasy community. A couple guys had Javante Williams. With Kenneth Gainwell and Trey Sermon, the only other two running backs from the 2021 class with positive scores over zero. And I mean, it's pretty obvious to see that the class wasn't very good last year, which is why um, a lot of us weren't very excited about it. And Trey Sermon, as it currently stands, probably is the biggest bust of this group. Uh, The indicators were there, in my opinion. While he had solid size, draft capital, and age for the position, the tape wasn't very good from what I saw. And the journey that he had in college should have been a red flag having to transfer away never commanding a full workload, all that kind of stuff. In my opinion, he was propped up by the fact that he was uh, drafted to the 49ers and also that he got third round draft capital and, you know, Kyle Shanahan handpicked him or whatever. Um, because while those things are important for running backs, you at least have to be competent to be able to make, uh, you know, right on those, on those uh, peripherals. And Sermon, for me, was a big hit because I was not in on Trey Sermon. I avoided him in all my rookie drafts. I had zero shares outside of uh, one league where I got him in like the 14th, 15th round of a startup. And if you guys followed the channel at all last year, you know that I did not like Trey Sermon one bit. And some of the biggest, I would say, like sneaky hits from this class, at least from what we've seen in their rookie seasons, were Elijah Mitchell, obviously, who had a top 20 season this year. Khalil Herbert, who was good in spurts in relief of David Montgomery. And Ramondre Stevenson, who was good when he uh, got opportunity as well. Easy cop-out answer for me uh, to say why I liked these guys over, because I was in on all three of those dudes in rookie drafts, is because I just thought their tape was good. I, I had better tape grades on on all three of those guys than I did on Trey Sermon, than I did on uh, Chuba Hubbard. I had better tape grades on them than I did on, uh, you know, Jamar Jefferson, who had sneaky, you know, people that were in on him and uh, some other guys like that. So um, those guys were good, you know, on film, which is why I probably was in on them. But analytically, none of these guys were very good. They were older prospects. One of the, one of the things that you could point to, it, going back to that Eureka moment that I had in the wide receivers video, is that all three of these guys gradually improved throughout their college careers. They got better workloads. They got you know more productive, more efficient, et cetera, throughout their college careers, which is definitely something you can point to as maybe a reason why they worked out because they got better throughout their college careers. But regardless, any way you slice it, none of these guys were very good prospects on paper. You had to watch the film to like them. And uh, that's kind of what led me to like those guys and end up with a lot of shares of uh, Elijah Mitchell and Khalil Herbert, especially, but a couple of Ramondre shares as well. All of them looked good with their opportunity uh, when they got it. And all three of them, I would say, returned on the third or the fourth round rookie pick that you spent on them back in 2021 rookie drafts. And all those guys had pretty decent size with good athleticism. Also, Elijah Mitchell was tough to gauge in this exercise because his size is completely unknown. It says right now that he's listed at like 202 pounds, but he was 202 at his pro day, but he was 215 at the senior bowl a month and a half earlier during the draft process. So coming off of the season, uh, going to the senior bowl, I expect him to be more around 210, 215 at his playing weight. And he slimmed down to 202 so that he could run sub 44, which he ended up doing. So I tend to think his playing weight is more 210, 215, which is probably uh, something that if I adjusted it, Uh, his BMI would have been better. His weight would have been better and he would have cleared those thresholds and had a better score. But regardless, let's move on to the 2020 class because it's a lot more interesting. I mean, right off the bat, you can see that the scores are just much, much higher from the 2021 class. And this is something we knew going into the class. This is something that we know now. We knew that this 2020 class was going to be very, very loaded at running back, very, very deep at running back as well. The highest scores in this class went to Jonathan Taylor, duh, Cam Akers, uh, J.K. Dobbins, and A.J. Dillon, all with scores over 10. Antonio Gibson, DeAndre Swift, and CEH, as well as Darrington Evans, had the final uh, scores above you know five or whatever, above seven in that area. So many of these guys had great measurables, athleticism, speed, et cetera. It's the reason that this class was so deep and so productive. The biggest bust from this class is obviously Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Clyde Edwards Hilaire was, you know, the one-on-one for a lot of people taking over Jonathan Taylor and people mostly just overvalued the Kansas city landing spot, the first round draft capital that Clyde offered. And they failed to ignore the fact that he had never commanded really a big workload in college. He was part of a a historic LSU offense that was pretty much making everybody elevated. And and we now, we kind of know now that having Justin Jefferson and Jamar chase on the same field was probably the reason that Clyde Edwards Hilaire was able to be so efficient. And on top of all that, he also was like undersized to five foot seven, 207 pounds, not a very good athlete. Uh, speed score was pretty low. Math bomb score just cleared 
uh, the relative athletic score uh, threshold, basically. So Clyde Edwards Hilaire, when he went to the Kansas City Chiefs, went from a guy that probably should have been like the RB5, 6, 7 in this class behind JT, Akers, Dobbins, Swift, maybe even Antonio Gibson or AJ Dillon, to a guy that elevated himself way above those guys just because he went in the first round to the Kansas City Chiefs. And I think had Clyde Edwards Hilaire gone to a team that was going to use him in the passing game a little bit more, he might have had a different career trajectory uh, so far. But I think Right now, we're kind of looking at a guy that might be is definitely a bust from a fantasy perspective, but could be an NFL bust as well um, because he, he's been solid when he gets opportunities, but they never use him as a receiver, and it was his calling card in college. One note on J.K. Dobbins uh, for his math bomb score because you guys can see a U beside it um, because it's unofficial is because I had to use high school metrics to fill in some of the blanks because he didn't actually test at the combine. He did a couple things at his pro day. So to get an RAS score for him, I actually threw his high school testing numbers in for his three cone and his short shuttle. And even then he was still the best pound for pound athlete in this entire class, which is saying a lot, knowing what we know about Cam Akers and Jonathan Taylor as athletes coming out as well. So, I mean, Dobbins was my RB2 this year uh, in 2020. Uh, it was like my first, I would say a first official year kind of ranking prospects. My Twitter account was starting to get going or whatever. JK Dobbins was my RB2 that year behind Jonathan Taylor. He plays in the most run friendly offense in the entire NFL. Do not sleep on JK Dobbins. If he is at any, you know, capacity, hundred percent healthy, I expect him to smash this year in fantasy cam Akers, similar case as well. What I, what put cam Akers into Jonathan Taylor territory uh, in terms of his uh, score because they had the exact same score was the ability to handle a big workload. Both of those guys had very, very high dominator ratings with Cam Akers uh, scoring green in both dominator and target share. That is extremely relevant now because despite coming six months off torn Achilles in the playoffs, Cam Akers went right back to getting his full workload. We saw the Rams give him a huge workload at the end of his rookie year. And it's something that I expected coming into the season for Cam Akers before he tore his Achilles. And as soon as he came back, they were just ready to give him the full workload again because he was a workhorse in college, uh, workhorse in spurts in the NFL. I think Cam Akers, again, another guy, assuming the health is okay, should be set to smash this year from a, a dynasty and a redraft perspective. You guys know that I'm very high on both of those guys. AJ Dillon and Antonio Gibson were probably the biggest surprises of this class, I would say, but not necessarily because a lot of people did like these guys. Um, but the reason they were surprised is because they had a lot of question marks. Gibson didn't even play running back in college. He was a wide receiver in college, but he did check the size, speed, athleticism combo like nobody's business. Also was a very good receiving back, obviously. Hasn't really translated yet to the NFL, but um, something that we should have seen with Antonio Gibson was the size, speed, athleticism combination. Same goes for AJ Dillon, who was a freakish, like 245 pounds running, you know, 117 weight adjusted speed score, which puts him basically in like Derrick Henry territory. The fact that these guys were going after Zach Moss and Keyshawn Vaughn and rookie drafts was a travesty. In my opinion, I took both of them, you know, way before those guys in the rookie drafts that I had back then on those two guys, they've probably been the biggest bust of this class. I would say uh, Zach Moss and Keyshawn Vaughn. The only real commonalities that you can point to with those two players is the fact that both of them were older prospects, 22 and a half, 23 years old coming out. And the fact that they had that red flag career trajectory that I talked about for Trey Sermon. And in the wide receivers video, I talked about for Jalen Rager and Nikhil Harry and LaVisca Chenault, some of the wide receivers that have bust, uh, busted because both guys peaked before their draft eligible seasons and they didn't really build upon that. So ideally, the ideal career trajectory we want to see for running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks, whatever the case is, is that you are productive at a young age, if possible. Then in your second season, you have, you know, you take a big step forward. And then in your junior season, you take another big step forward and you have a three year college career of constant progression. Uh, you know, culminating in a great junior season. That would be the ideal career trajectory for most of these players. But with Keyshawn Vaughn and with Zach Moss, both of these guys either peaked as a junior or as a sophomore and then really didn't build upon that production uh, going forward into their career. And that's the same kind of uh, pattern that we saw with Jalen Rager. It's the same pattern we saw with Nikhil Harry, some of the biggest wide receiver busts from the last couple of draft classes. So something that definitely applied to the running back position as well, because I was actually looking for it this time. Uh, whereas in the wide receiver one, it kind of just smacked me in the face as a trend. If we look at these guys' trajectories uh, of the players that hit from this draft class, it's much more promising, right? You guys can see J uh, J.K. Dobbins, Jonathan Taylor, Cam Akers, and DeAndre Swift, who are, I would consider, probably the biggest hits from this draft class at running back. You can see that J.K. Dobbins had a productive freshman season, down sophomore year, but exploded as a junior. Jonathan Taylor, productive all three years, probably one of the most productive college running backs we've ever seen. But the big progression for him was as a receiver his junior season. So he did progress in that area. Cam Akers, um, again, pretty productive freshman season, 
down sophomore year. Then he had like a workhorse role, productive as a receiver in his junior season. DeAndre Swift, even as part of a huge running back by committee at Georgia, got more and more uh, volume as his college career went along and also more productive as a rusher as well. So uh, that trend definitely reared its ugly head yet again for some of these big busts, but it also applies for some of the biggest hits as well. When we see these guys progress throughout their college careers, it's something that we need to pay attention to. And also, like I said, something that uh, applied to Trey Sermon in the 2021 class, by the way, as well, you guys can see his numbers on the screen. He never really had a very productive season. And even though uh, he probably had his most productive or his most efficient season as a senior, it just wasn't really all that spectacular 116 rush attempts and uh, 19 targets is not something to write home about. So let's move on finally to the 2019 class which is um, a class that is tough to gauge. I would say the guy at the top for me back in 2019, when I was watching these players initially was Josh Jacobs. I thought he was the best back in the class. The production wasn't great. Obviously, any way you slice it, he did not have a great production profile because he went to Alabama and Damien Harris, Bo Scarborough, freshman Najee Harris were who he was competing for touches with, along with the fucking elite wide receiver core that they had there at Alabama. The tape was phenomenal though. And when you watch Josh Jacobs tape in 2019, And the peripherals too, the size, the draft capital, young player, great BMI, all that kind of stuff made me comfortable betting on Josh Jacobs. So, I mean, he was my RB1 in that class and I really didn't have any, you know, questions about it. He was easily my RB1 in that class. The highest scores though, when you look at these, these actual metrics went to David Montgomery, who aside from Josh Jacobs is the only running back from this class to have an RB1 season. And he's actually the highest finish of any running back in this class, higher than Josh Jacobs finishing as a top six back in 2020. He's a pretty easy projection uh, when you look at his profile and yet another example of how being a workhorse in college can translate into being a workhorse in the NFL. And obviously the, the parallels being Iowa State, you know, Brees Hall, who came out this year, it's a pretty ironclad production profile, similar to what we saw with David Montgomery, except Brees Hall is a much better athlete than David Montgomery. So that uh, should get you pretty excited if you drafted Brees Hall in rookie drafts this year. Daryl Henderson was actually the second highest of these scores here. Um, with Miles Sanders in the top five as well. And I would consider, I would say Daryl Henderson and Miles Sanders are probably the two biggest disappointments from this class. I wouldn't say that they were bust because I think they're good running backs. It's just that neither of these guys kind of lived up to the expectations that they had at some point in their career. Because at some point in Miles Sanders' career, following his rookie season, we thought he was going to be a top five dynasty running back. Same goes for Daryl Henderson. Once Todd Gurley was gone, we thought he was going to get thrust into this huge workload. And I would consider these two guys the biggest disappointments because they had those expectations behind them. The good news is that Miles Sanders and Daryl Henderson both had windows where you could have sold them if you didn't believe in their ability or if you didn't believe in them, which most of you guys might have done, especially considering how high Miles Sanders was going following his rookie season in Dynasty Startups. Their career trajectories were tough to gauge, though. When you look at their Uh, their college career trajectories, there isn't really anything that I can point to because each guy made a solid progression. Miles Sanders, obviously the narrative was that he was behind Saquon Barkley, his freshman and junior and uh, sophomore season, and then broke out as a junior. Daryl Henderson um, didn't really get a full workload until his junior season. So I would say the issues for both of these guys in the NFL has been their inability to hold up to a full workload. Anybody who's had Miles Sanders or Daryl Henderson in fantasy has gotten good weeks out of those guys but it has not been consistent over an entire season because they always are dealing with ticky tack injuries or whatever the case is. So I would say the fact that neither of these guys had, you know, multiple years of big workloads is probably why they didn't work out in the NFL. Neither is a bad running back. They're both talented players, but neither guy has been able to hold up to a full workload like David Montgomery has like Josh Jacobs has uh, from this draft class with both of those guys hovering around 210 pounds, but 220 plus for David Montgomery and Josh Jacobs. So um, that's something to keep, uh, keep in mind is that if you have a smaller back that wasn't really handling a big workload in college, that might be a concern that they can't handle a big workload in the NFL, because even though Christian McCaffrey was a smaller back coming out, he had been a workhorse for multiple years. So we're able to kind of envision that he's going to be able to handle a full workload. So, uh, definitely something to keep in mind. The next highest score from this class was actually Alexander Madison. And he looks like he would have been a great sleeper to invest in. I wasn't on uh, Alexander Madison. Coming out of this class, I didn't really know a whole lot about him. Profiles pretty similar, uh, similarly this year uh, to Rashad White and Isaiah Spiller, right? Because Alexander Madison went to the Vikings. We knew they had Dalvin Cook. We knew he was just going to be a handcuff, at least for the time being, which is kind of the similar outlook we're seeing for Rashad White and Isaiah Spiller as it currently stands. But all those guys kind of have solid scores to the point that if they get the opportunity, they might be quite good for fantasy. And at least for the duration of their rookie contract or however long those veterans are there, 
um, Leonard Fournette and Austin Eckler, those guys should at least be very good handcuffs, maybe with some standalone value. So both of those guys, if you can get them, you know, late second, early third round of your rookie drafts, definitely a, a solid investments. Unfortunately, both of them are going probably in the early second round of most people's rookie drafts, just due to the weakness of this class relative to the class in 2020 uh, and 2019, they were a little deeper. Uh, Damian Harris and Devin Singletary both also came from this class had their best seasons this year. Damian Harris with a, with a monster touchdown output, Devin Singletary finally commanding a pretty big workload, uh, solid picks from this class. If you guys drafted these guys back in 2019 and held them the whole year, uh, the whole time, I'm sure they've been fine for you. I wouldn't classify them as like hits necessarily. They were probably just kind of like a base hit uh, speaking in baseball terms. It was just like a single, nothing like a double triple grand slam or anything like that. So that's basically uh, the 2019 class. Um, there's not really much else I can take away from this. Benny Snell had a good score as well. Um, but he didn't really land in the most advantageous position in terms of like a, an aging big Ben with uh with a bad offensive line. So not necessarily great for him. And also he's just a little undynamic um, for the position. So um, with that being said, if you guys did enjoy this video, again, a little more anecdotal than uh, the type of videos that we usually like to make, it's not a whole lot of actionable content that comes out of this aside from what the implications are for next year's draft class. But I hope you did enjoy this. Uh, we've been doing dynasty decisions all week. So I kind of needed a little bit of a break from it. wanted to do something uh, solo. So if you did enjoy, like, comment, subscribe. Like I said, if you guys want access to our dynasty rankings manifesto, all of our dynasty databases, I'll put all this data on our Patreon. If you want to check it out, link down below. Our redraft rankings manifesto will be coming next week. We'll be coming at you with some you know hard-hitting redraft takes on uh, our top 12s and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, and also make sure to check out underdogfantasy.com, our official show sponsor, promo code FSE at sign up and first deposit. The puppy drafts are about to wrap up. Only $5 to get in. 75,000 goes to first place if you guys end up winning. And it's one of those things that'll just get you great practice uh, for your home league draft, for your redraft leagues that you guys probably care a lot about. And uh, they're just a ton of fun and you could win a ton of money doing them. So promo code FSE will get you 100% match back on whatever you put in. You'll also get our Dynasty Rankings Manifesto and our Redraft man uh, Rankings Manifesto when it comes out. Uh, for free as a thank you for using those promo codes. All you have to do is put in like 10 bucks, 20 bucks on Underdog Fantasy. You'll get a, a match back from them and our uh, rankings for free. So no, no better deal than that. Uh, with that being said, peace out. We'll talk to you soon.